uh, going to be hearing from today as part of the Project Wicked uh, seminar series, and then let uh, Stephen and, and Brady uh, give them the presentations. Again, we have uh, uh, Stephen going first uh, for the first half an hour. There'll be questions during that first half hour, and then Brady will take um, the, the second half hour. Uh, Stephen is a, is a graduate student working on his PhD in chemical oceanography here at UD. Uh, he is a, a true blue hen, right? He's earned both his bachelor and master's degree uh, from UD, uh, but he spent time outside of UD as well. He's conducted a coral reef research in the Northwest Hawaii Islands and helped establish a marine carbonate chemistry baselines in the Canadian uh, Arctic archipelago. Even before coming back to UD in September of 2020, he developed and managed and guided an acidific acidification monitoring program in the greater Puget Sound area that took from a you know temporary grant to a, a larger uh, permanent um, monitoring program, one of the largest taken on and sustaining uh, by any state regulatory agency in the U.S. And now as a doctoral student at UD, his work pro uh, broadly focuses on pH sensor development and leveraging sensors and other monitoring assets to help a baseline study of the estuarine and coastal ocean acidification in the inland bays, um, and also helping out with the shellfish aquaculture industry in and around the region. So we're super excited that Stephen's here to, to share the work that he and his colleagues are doing. Uh, and then you'll hear from Brady. Uh, Brady actually graduated in 2020 from the University of South Carolina, and he has his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. Now, as a PhD student in the Department of Chemical and Molecular Engineering at UD, uh, he's also serving time as a Denon Fellow. Um, his research revolves around the electrification of chemical processes to promote sustainability. So we have two really exciting experts doing some exciting new work, and we look forward to hearing from them today. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, Finda, uh, I'll take it from there. Thank you. Um, if you see me looking up, I have two screens, so I have to manage the whole cursor situation on the screen. So if you see me looking up, I'm still getting the presentation, even though I might not be making eye contact uh, with the audience. Uh, as Dr. Messer said, uh, my name is Stephen Gonski. I'm a PhD student at the University of Delaware. I'm working with uh, Dr. Weijin Sai and Dr. George Luther uh, down here in Lewis at the Hugh R. Sharp campus of the University of Delaware, part of the School of Marine Science and Policy. Um, so I'll broadly be talking about uh, the monitoring work I've been doing for estuary and coastal ocean acidification in the inland bays down here in Sussex County and its potential impacts on the shellfish aquaculture industry that people are trying to bring back, uh, that people have been trying to bring back over the last five years. And if you notice, there's quite an extensive author list uh, for the presentation because I've gotten a lot of help uh, both inside my laboratory uh, in, Newis, in Newark and then a lot of people down here in Lewis as well from uh, Delaware Sea Grant and the uh, Delaware Star for the Inland Bays, where Zach Garmo and Andrew McGowan uh, hail from as well. So let's get started. Um, these are just the affiliations of the authors uh, people can look at when the recording goes out. Um, so Delaware's Inland Bays, are, there's, a, there's an image over here on your uh, right. Uh, there's three Inland Bays we have here in Delaware. We have Rehoboth Bay, and Indian River Bay, and then we have Little Aswin down here. Little Aswin Bay down here. Uh, my fork focuses on Rehoboth and Indian River Bay, so I'll be talking about these in particular, but I'll just add, uh, my family's been in Delaware for the last 15 years. And I actually live uh, right in this area of the last one Bay along Durkson Creek. Uh, so the work I'm doing really hits home because I know it's needed and I believe in what we're doing and I think it'll go a long way uh, for the people down here and also for the state. Uh, real quick, as I said, there are three inland bays we have in Delaware. Um, I'll be focusing on Little Indian River and at Rehoboth Bays uh, in particular. Um, and Recently, there's been an economic evaluation of the Inland Bays, and it's been found that it contributes four and a half billion dollars and 35,000 jobs to the state economy every year. So it's very important, although the kind of the kicker here is um, even though that's really good, the water quality in the bays is actually very poor. Uh, so the Delaware Center for the Inland, Inland Bays publishes the State of the Bays report every five years, and the current one that came out uh, just as 2021, but it just got released um, shortly before this uh, due to Delays with COVID actually graded water quality at D. So you see kind of the contrast between how good it is economically for the state and how poorly it's being managed or just water quality is a problem. And the inland bays are dominantly a drain of 320 square mile predominantly agricultural watershed. Um, but over the last uh, 10 years, especially since my family's been here, there's been rapid large scale development and population growth uh, in these areas down here in Sussex County because a lot of people want to live. <laughs> 
at the beach, which is great uh, for Sussex County, but we need to manage this appropriately. Um, so that can be kind of an issue. So because of this, there's been a lot of increasing anthropogenic pressures placed on the bays um, because of that. And I should also add that the inland bays are also very shallow. The mean depth is only about three to eight feet and they're poorly flushed by the ocean. So that means they're susceptible to um, large temperature and salinity variation. And also if there's a lot of terrestrial inputs coming in at certain seasons, they'll just stick around in the bay for a long period of time, which can also drive extreme uh, biological fluctuations as well. Um, so as I said, water quality is not very good in the bays, um, but a good thing is people are trying to bring back oysters and shellfish aquaculture in the bays. So this could potentially be one of the solutions to this issue. Um, and this uh, figure was taken from, I believe the IPCC reports. I got, this, I got this slide from a friend of mine. This just shows some of the ecosystem services that oysters provide. Uh, most importantly, uh, it removes excess inorganic nitrogen from the water column through denitrification. So oysters naturally filter water. So this could be one of the potential um, solutions for improving water quality in the bays. And also another important thing is it makes it, since it improves water clarity and improves water quality, seagrass can also grow in areas with oysters. And that's another way to buffer against acidification of nearshore systems and also improve water quality as well. But as you can see, there are plenty of other um, benefits that oysters provide uh, that you can uh, read about at your leisure um, after this recording goes out. Um, just a quick history of shellfish aquaculture in the bays. Uh, over here on your right, um, this is a figure of all the uh, aquaculture leases we currently have in the inland bays. As I said, there's still some stuff down here in Little Aspen Bay further south towards Fenwick Island, uh, but we're not going to discuss that because my work focuses in Rehoboth Bay here and Indian River Bay here. Um, and in this figure, uh, the red areas are prohibited for shellfish aquaculture development. Um, these areas are really shallow when there's a lot of development. Um, so hazards, so potentially shellfish would provide a shipping hazard or a boating hazard if people are using operating watercraft in those areas. And the green areas are areas that are currently leased um, under um, DENREX, DENREX um, permitting requirements for this. And then areas in yellow are areas that can be seasonally approved and are open for leasing uh, in the future if people so chose. As you can see, they kind of hug the west coast of, or the western coast of Rehoboth Bay in the northern north Northern coast of Edinburgh Bay, this is around Sally Cove right here, and this is the Camp Arrowhead area, and then we also have a little bit uh, down here by White Creek uh, near Holtz Landing State Park, which is just over here um, on your left, if you're familiar with the area. Um, just a quick, some quick stats here. Um, so we're trying to bring back the oyster aquaculture industry around the Eastern Oyster. Uh, the first commercial sale was in 2018, although um, it's important to note that we, Delaware, used to have a very healthy aquaculture industry in the 1980s and 70s, um, but that crashed because of all the stuff that's been going on with development here. And so we're trying to bring it back. And it's also important to note that there's 10 current commercial leases in the bays and only 23 of the 343 shellfish approved, shellfish aquaculture approved development areas are currently leased. And the current total of oysters being harvested from the inland bays is only 431,000. To give you an idea of what this is compared to what the East Coast is doing, the whole East Coast industry was that at 119 million dollars coastwide in 20, 2011. Um, so Delaware's cap or share of that was practically zero. So that's um, something that the that the economy could be benefiting from if we bring it back. Um, and it's important to note that, uh, as I said, a healthy, thriving aquaculture industry in the bays will increase revenues, provide jobs, grow the bays' economic value, potentially improve water quality, and just improve the quality of life uh, for people down here in Sussex County. Uh, now we're going to review a little bit of ocean acidification, the ring carpet system that provides relevance to what we're doing here. Um, this diagram right here on your left gives you the uh, schematic of what happens to acidify the ocean, at least in the open ocean, due to absorption of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Uh, it gets dissolved in water, combines with water to form carbonic acid, and then gives off protons to disassociate into bicarbonate here and carbonate. And these protons are what actually makes the ocean more acidic. As you can see, there's a gradient going from uh, greenish blue to dark blue, and that's um, increasing acidity moving from left to right. Um, there are four marine carbon system parameters that we can monitor, and then you monitor the carbon system by actually monitoring a few of those parameters. And I'll just say the OA trend is going in red next to them. Uh, the four parameters are total dissolving organic carbon. Uh, when under acidification conditions, those values are usually high or increasing. 
a total alkalinity, which is how much buffer or how much excess base is in the water to buffer against acidification. There's no trend just based on this process alone. Uh, we have partial pressure of carbon dioxide or PCO2, which is higher increase of intercipitation conditions than pH or how acidic the water actually is. And that can be low or decreasing under ocean acidification. A few other important ones include carbon ion saturate, carbonate ion concentration right here, which is this right here. This is the concentration usually under OA. Um, that's also lower decreasing. And then carbonate is used to calculate calcium carbon saturation state, which is what oysters depend on to build their shells. And under acidification, those values are also low or decreasing. Those are indicators of acidification. And just to know, um, based on the thermodynamics of the system, we only need two of these four parameters here in bold uh, to calculate the rest of the system. Uh, these other, the other four, we have two of them that are measured. Um, this is a quick repeat of figure from what I presented last month. Uh, this just shows how complex estuarine, ocean estuarine and coastal ocean acidification is. As I said, air she exchange is CO2 is what really drives acidification in near shore air in the open ocean, but here in the near shore areas, as we get close to the land, uh, there are a lot of other processes that can be uh, affecting stuff. And a lot of these are, is, are what we're seeing affecting the bays as well. Um, just to review uh, calcium carbon mineral saturation state, this is what a uh, proxy for how good shellfish could be doing in the bays. So it's relevant for the shellfish aquaculture in the bays as well. Um, so this is denoted omega, as you see, and anything greater than one um, is known as our supersaturated conditions, and it favors oyster shell growth or oyster building or shell building for oysters, and anything below one uh, favors dissolution, and that's undersaturated conditions, and that favors dissolving or dissolution of the oyster shells over time. And I should say, this is good for oysters, this is bad for oysters. So just remember this threshold moving forward. Um, this is the reaction we get. Uh, we have calcium combining with carbonate to form calcium carbonate, and this is how you calculate a saturation state, the concentrations of the two reactants divided by the solubility product, KSP. And this is how this interacts with ocean Um, This is taken from the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab. It's a NOAA lab in Washington State. As we have CO2 go into the water, um, CO2 combines with water and carbonate to form two bicarbonate. And when this as this happens, you also have two protons being given off that can also lead to decreasing pH. And as you can see, as this process goes over time, you're gonna make it harder and harder for calcifying organisms to build their shells and survive. So oysters, so the main thing is oysters and shellfish aquaculture activities in near shore regions are vulnerable to acidification in near shore areas. Uh, just to get into the data real quick, uh, this, we just did some system-wide sampling between July, 2021, and it's still mm -hmm. ongoing, although I'll only show data up to November, 2022, which is what we have so far has been QSCD and compiled. Uh, we have nine stations that we sample in Indian River Bay uh, down here. And I should say triangles are just sampling sites. Uh, anything noted with a square are sites that are co-located with uh, biogeochemical sensors, either operated by us, the US Geological Survey, the Delaware Center for Inland Bays, and anything in di with diamonds are denoted are co-located with um, oyster aquaculture sites or nursery operations and sensors, and we sample those sites as well. And the main thing with these uh, sites, the way it was designed is we just wanted to collect samples across the salinity gradient in the systems to make sure we're getting the full uh, range of variability. And we also chose these sites based on co-location with um, existing monitoring assets and aquaculture operations as well when uh, feasible. And I should say here in Indian River Bay, the main freshwater sources that are, we are uh, monitoring are Indian River here, uh, Pepper Creek here and Vines Creek here, and then over here in Rehoboth Bay, uh, we have Love Creek two stations, both the upper estuary and the lower estuary. And then we also have collected uh, a, a samples at a station at the Creek Fork between Herring Creek and Guinea Creek, which are two big freshwater inputs to Rehoboth Bay as well. Um, this just shows the temperature. Um, so right here, this figure is temperature from our water samples collected during monthly sampling. Uh, we have temperature here on your left. Then we have time or date on your x-axis here. Uh, circles are any river bay, squares are Hobbit Bay, and then uh, superimposed is just the trend uh, we have at any river inlet uh, by the Coast Guard station where we sample. And I, sh and, um, I should mention we only started sampling Rehoboth Bay starting in June because um, that was part of the work I'm doing for my climate change hub grant that I'll discuss uh, at the end. And as you can see, there's strong temperature variability here starting in the summer, um, going about 30, 35, all the way down to close to zero in the winter, then back up heading back into the spring and summer, then back down into the fall. 
It's interesting to note that everything going on, since the system is very shallow, um, the interior of the bay is usually warmer uh, in the summer relative to the inlet, but then during the winter, sometimes it's normally cooler, and then that trend prevails too, so that's going to affect uh, what's going on in the system as well at that time. Um, then here is salinity. You also see um, here we have the same thing. We have salinity on your y-axis here. Then we have time on the x-axis. Same thing. Circles are Indian River Bay. Squares are Hobbit Bay. And then superimposed in dark blue and dotted line is what we're seeing at the inlet every month. And you also see a little bit of a salinity decline here as well seasonally with generally higher salinities in the uh, spring and summer than heading into uh, November to April. From fall into early spring, we have a little lower salinity. Uh, at the interior of the bay and then back up uh, to higher salinities moving back into the summer and fall again. Um, now we have, so we talked about TA to DIC. Uh, we have a T, this is the TA to DIC ratio. So the ratio, the ratio of TA to DIC in the water column from our samples. And you have this over here on your Y axis. And then you have time over here on your X axis. And this is color coded by temperature. As we saw with the great variation in temperature, this is a temperature controlled system. To a certain extent, same thing. We have circles of Indian River Bay, squares of Rehoboth Bay, and then the dark blue dotted line is superimposed what we're seeing at the inlet. And it's important to note, um, so the thing with DIC to TA, TA to DIC ratios is this ratio is indicative of some biological processes that are going on in the interior of the bay that have been confirmed by a dissolved oxygen and chlorophyll data that's not directly discussed uh, in this presentation because of the, the 20 to 25 minute format we have. Um, so as you can see, um, it's TADIC ratios are much higher uh, during the um, about November to April, so fall and early spring versus the uh, late spring into summer and early fall. So this means that there's likely more biological production photosynthesis that'll that produces alkalinity but decreases uh, DIC going on in the bay from November to April, whereas there's more less less photosynthesis in the fall in the spring and summer, early fall, or more respiration. It's just, there are different, different biological processes that are controlling at different times during the year in the system. Uh, now we're getting into TH, uh, which is actually calculated from TA and DIC. Uh, here we have, so we actually measure TH uh, directly in our lab at 25 degrees, but this is corrected to the institute temperature, but you saw a few slides ago. So here we have temperature on the y-axis, and then we have time on the x-axis, again, color-coded, as a function of temperature, uh, with the same data shown from Indian River Bay and circles, we're hoping Bay and squares, and Indian River Inlet superimposed, and a dark blue dotted line. As you can see, the trend we see in this kind of follows temperature. Uh, you would expect lower pH at higher temperature, and then you expect a higher pH at lower temperature as we go through the seasons. Um, but the interesting thing to note is that the highest pH, which is indicative of the least, of less or not much acidification, is happening between about November to April, while stuff is more seasonally acidified in the late spring to fall between May to October. It's interesting that this happens because this scales the reverse of what's seen in most other systems I've studied in estuaries. And then here we have, uh, this is partial pressure of carbon dioxide uh, calculated from DIC and TA. Uh, we have TCO2 here at microatmospheres on the x-axis on your left and time on your y-axis, again, as a function of temperature. Uh, same uh, regime we've had in the past with the New River Hobbit Bays and the inlet, but then we also have uh, the atmospheric satur atmospheric value for PCO2 uh, taken from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii on the Big Island. And it's important to note that um, above this line, the bays are actually a CO2, a CO2 source or source of CO2 to the atmosphere. So essentially the bays are emitting carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And when it's below this line, the bays are absorbing uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, and I should say the greater that the vet, the great, and this process is driven by the gradient between whatever is in the water and whatever in the atmosphere. So the higher values in the water is more CO2 being emitted from the bays to the atmosphere over this period of time. And it's just interesting that it's so high in the, in the spring, summer, and early fall, but then essentially just reverses course directly going into the fall, winter, and early spring here from November to April, and then picks back up. Uh, between May to October again. So this is a very uh, powerful image about what's, hap what, what's happening with the bays um, as far as acidification and just marine carbon chemistry go, generally speaking. 
And this is what we talked about. So this is uh, this is this is what's important for oyster. This is a uh, saturation state of aragonite, which is a form of calcium carbonate. And the interesting thing is, so we have a saturation state of aragonite here on your y-axis. Again, then we have uh, time on the x-axis. As a, it's a color code as a function of temperature again. And again, circles denote Indian River Bay, squares are Hobbit Bay. Uh, what's going on at the inlet, uh, where we exchange with the Atlantic Ocean is superimposed in dark blue, a dotted line, and then aragonite saturation at one, which represents supersaturated, which is the transition between supersaturated. So anything up here is conducive for shell building and survival of oysters, and anything below this line down here is not favorable for oysters or shelf shock culture, and this is where shells are either going to dissolve or oysters are going to be more stressed and won't be able to build uh, their shells as effectively. Um, it's just interesting to note that, that based on this data, that aragonite saturation state is pretty much above one the entire year, except for some, some of these stations down here. And I should note, although I'm not showing against functions of salinity, that these lower values here are usually all this scales as to a function of salinity as we sample every month. So up here would be more of the interior bay regions near the ocean. And then down here, these values are more of the freshwater end members. Um, like the creeks and the river. However, uh, in this area, there's not really shelter shock culture going on. So that's less important for the industry because you can't actually grow oysters in that area due to the dead wreck uh, permitting requirements and guidance on this. Um, but again, it's also interesting that we're seeing much higher saturation states in the winter, early spring, and late fall as well versus what's seen in the spring, late spring, summer, and early fall. And again, it, it follows a pretty general pattern. And you can see it even for news that goes back up here in November of 2022 again. So, yeah, uh, just some key takeaways as we're approaching the end of the presentation. Um, temperature and biological processes largely modulate uh, ECOA conditions, restoring coastal acidification conditions in the bays. Um, we have stronger system-wide ECOA signals between May to October. That means that that's indicative of higher PCO2 and lower pH, uh, for example. Uh, those signals are stronger between May to October, while things improve from November to April. And as we mentioned, the bays are a source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere between May and October based on our data. And they're a sink, or they're going to absorb uh, CO2 from the atmosphere between November and April. Um, and again, the good thing about all this is a uh, saturation state is relatively decoupled uh, from these indicators of ECOA, like um, the high PCO2 and low pH seasonally, and generally remains super saturated year round. And these higher values are beneficial for and will support oysters and the aquaculture industry uh, as things ramp up here, hopefully in the next few years. Um, but then another, another thing to mention is, I don't go into this in a lot of detail, we still see extensive variability in river and creek stations around the inland bays where we see the most temperature and biological and biogeochemical fluctuations. Um, and it's important to note just to take away these are limited daytime data that only provide snapshots of baseline ECOA conditions in the base. So we need more work and more context to get a more complete picture for what's actually going on. And um, I don't have time to get into this um, a lot because there are several other dynamics to this data that could be presented. Uh, but several knowledge gaps remain. First and foremost, we need to know what the contributions of groundwater are to the marine carbon system and ECOA in the basis. This represents 70 to 80 percent of our freshwater inputs here. Uh, we need to look at the ECOA data we have in the context of other coast stressors. So that means combining it with all our sensor data for DO, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, all the co-located organic matter data that's being collected, the inorganic nitrogen, inorganic phosphorus, all the nutrient data we have. We need to put these conditions into historical context, both past conditions through historical data comparisons, if there's any historical data we can use and leverage, but also put them in a future context. So that means updating water quality and marine ecosystem models with climate change models that specifically target the marine carbon system and ocean acidification. And it's just interesting that we need to figure out if there are any human dimensions present to this issue, because I don't think it's any surprise that we have stronger signals kind of in the tourist season down here between Labor Day, Memorial Day and Labor Day between May to October, but thing instant, there's like a little valve or switch that gets flipped and stuff improves substantially between November and April when it's kind of the off season. So I'd be interested to talk to anybody that might have a uh, perspective on what human dimensions might be present uh, to this data. Um, these are just um, all the people I have to thank for the work. A lot of people from the University of Delaware, Delaware Seagrant and, and U.S. Geological Survey, Delaware Geological Survey has been very helpful. 
Um, I didn't prevent, I didn't present a lot of our sensor data from the Coast Guard station, but the people at the Coast Guard station, specifically Chief Andrew Knox, Boston's Mate First Class Nathan Green and Boston's Mate First Class Jonathan Folger have been very supportive of our sampling and sensor work there uh, at the inlet. Um, Mark Casey, who runs Delaware Culture Seafoods, actually hosts one of our sites uh, for sampling and sensors and also took us out to get samples in January that are still in the queue to be analyzed. And then finally, financial support for the work was provided by Project Wicked in the state of Delaware through this the grant that we're currently uh, presenting on for the project and also a climate a grant from the Climate Change Hub of the University of Delaware that I was awarded last year. And um, any questions? I know we're a little over time, but anyway, this just shows some of the fun I was having in the spring and summer of last year when we had sent to the Coast Guard Station. And a lot of what you're seeing here is only a week or a week and a half worth of growth. Uh, as far as biofouling goes, so I had a lot of fun with that. And the sensor data, what we have, will be forthcoming and should be finished processing and being compiled at the end of the month. So that'll be available for people to use as well uh, in the future. Thanks, Stephen. Um, are there any questions? You can put them in chat, or raise your hand, unmute yourself. Uh, Stephen, this is Wei Jun, and uh, my question is, well, excellent talk. My question is, what do you think uh, are the reasons behind that uh, fact since uh, uh, carbonate saturation state omega appears to be a decoupled indicator of ocean acidification, decoupled from pH and PCO2? You see yeah, that? Um, yeah, so I had, I'll just pull up an extra slide here real quick. Um, my, I mean, this is just kind of speculation at this point. This is DIC or dissolving air carbon. Um, over this period of time, uh, same regime we were looking at before with the circle squares and the inlet data. Um, so pH is modulated by the ratio of TA to DIC in the system. However, not only do we have very high DIC, um, usually in approaching, usually above 2000, and then even here, it's still pretty high at lower intermediate salinities, although it's not color code the function salinity now. But the important thing is DIC is also very high. You even reach almost 2200 uh, here in August. Um, in the bay. Um, so my, my speculation would be is that even though the pH is low and PCO2 is high, when you have higher DIC, you still have more substantial amounts of carbonate in the system. So if you have more carbonate, even if you have a lower pH and higher PCO2, if you still have higher DIC, you're still going to have higher relative amounts of carbonate that would keep uh, saturation states higher uh, than expected. But that would be my takeaway from that. Thank you. Um, we lost Wajin. I'm not sure what happened there. So I don't, uh, there, there he is. Wajin, did that answer your yeah, question? I, I I just get disconnected. <laughs> I, yeah. Anyway, that's okay. That's okay. Steve and I are chatting. Yeah. I, first time in the office, I get this. Hmm. Yeah. In the in interest of time, maybe you want to, yeah. Move yeah. On. We have time for one more question if someone else would like to ask a question. Okay, well, thank you, Stephen. Now we can turn it over to Brady. Uh, Stephen, can you stop sharing for a minute? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Good. All right. Can everybody see this okay? Yes, it looks good. Okay. Uh, so for those of you who missed the introduction earlier, uh, my name is Brady Crandall. I'm a fellow of the Delaware Environmental Institute and a PhD candidate in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. And today I will be discussing electrochemical strategies for addressing nitrate water pollution. So just to provide some, some brief background, um, nitrogenous fertilizer is absolutely vital for food production and in modern society. But excess nitrogen from animal waste and, and fertilizer are the leading causes of nitrate pollution in water. And this nitrate pollution poses a variety of health risks, including blue baby syndrome, where uh, not enough oxygen is able to get into the blood of infants, causing them to turn blue, as well as various types of cancers, um, and also poses a, a lot of environmental risks, including uh, acidification and eutrophication that leads to uh, toxic algal blooms and oxygen depletion. And uh, nitrates are, are a huge threat uh, here at home in Delaware. 
So Delaware is the most nitrate polluted state by area. And uh, recent work has found that 97% of our rivers and streams in Delaware are too polluted for safe public use due to nitrates. And 92% of this nitrate contamination in Delaware is a direct result of manure and fertilizer use. So to solve this issue uh, as an electric chemist, um, I approach this uh, with the concept of applying nitrate electrolysis to convert nitrate polluted water back to fertilizer, uh, which was the original source of the nitrate. Uh, so uh, an electrolyzer is simply a reactor that runs on electricity instead of heat. So in the system, we feed renewable electricity as well as our nitrate polluted water. Uh, the reaction shown below occurs and uh, we're able to produce green fertilizer using this method and I've shown a, a photo of the system on the right. So the dream here is that uh, we have our, our farm here in, in Delaware. Um, farmers will fertilize their crops using uh, an ammonia-based fertilizer. Uh, the crops will uptake um, a good portion of this ammonia, but the, the excess that they are unable to uptake uh, will end up as nitrate pollution in our, our waterways. Uh, then we can set these electrolyzers downstream, not too far from the, the source of the nitrates, and supply them with solar and, and wind electricity. And these electrolyzers will then neutralize the, the nitrates and convert them back to ammonia fertilizer that can again be applied to the farms. So we sort of have a, a closed loop system here to continually generate uh, green fertilizer um, while reducing nitrate concentrations in the water before it reaches the coast. However, um, I performed this reaction successfully, um, but when I looked into it uh, a little closer, uh, I found the techno-economics uh, don't look great. So uh, the way I studied this is I looked at sort of three different ways of producing fertilizer. The first being uh, the conventional Haber-Bosch process where we convert natural gas to fertilizer. Uh, of course, this results in a significant amount of CO2 emissions, so this isn't exactly the most sustainable method to produce fertilizer, but it is the most widely used in the US currently. Uh, the next method uh, was to use water electrolysis where a water molecule split and we produce green hydrogen using these electrolyzers. Um, green hydrogen has gained a, a lot of attention recently and one of the main applications is the production of green fertilizer. And then finally in blue, I have my nitrate electrolyzer system where we convert nitrate water pollution to ammonia. Um, if we look on the, on the y-axis here, I have the, the production cost in US dollars per ton of ammonia produced. And I've compared each of these scenarios. And you'll see very clearly that um, even when I model the most optimistic scenario possible for nitrate electrolysis, so pushing performance as high as possible, trying to you know, use a really optimistic uh, electricity price, uh, there's just absolutely no way it can compete uh, with sort of the green hydrogen route for producing fertilizer um, and doesn't even come close to competing uh, with the, the standard uh, fossil gas approach for producing fertilizer. Um, so the, this approach really lacks economic viability and uh, this really demonstrates the importance of performing these techno-economic studies so I don't waste uh, additional time pursuing something that um, won't actually work out and will never uh, be able to commercialize in the near future. So in order to address this problem of nitrate pollution, I had to, to take a big step back and sort of reevaluate um, where these nitrates were really coming from and understand the problem at a deeper level. So when you look, look at the, the nitrogen inputs in Delaware, um, about 44% comes from manure, about 47% comes from fertilizer, uh, but really about half of this fertilizer is used to produce food for animal feed, uh, for animal agriculture. Uh, so really, you can break it down in a different way and find that 68% of nitrate pollution uh, results from animal agriculture, a combination of the use of fertilizer to grow their food and also their manure. And in Delaware, um, one of the, the biggest sources of animal agriculture is, uh, of course, uh, poultry for those of us who live here, we know this. Um, and we, if you look at where these poultry farms are located, it's typically in southern Delaware. And so this poses a, a massive environmental justice issue, right? We see that the lowest um, income, uh, median household incomes are the most affected by the nitrate pollution because they're going to be located where there's the highest concentration of poultry farms. And in Northern Delaware, where median 
household income tends to be higher. Uh, we see virtually no poultry farms and very little nitrate pollution as a result. So, uh, you know, this is a trend we see across the US where those who are most socially and economically disadvantaged often face the, the brunt of pollution. Uh, we see this uh, uh, recently in East Palestine, Ohio. We've seen this in Flint, Michigan, and uh, we, we have this issue right here at home in Delaware. So uh, recently in Sussex County, for anyone who's, who's paid attention to the news, there, there was a massive uh, settlement um, and, and damages, multi hundreds of millions, I believe, uh, from a large poultry plant that had been uh, contaminating uh, groundwater in Sussex County for, for years, um, causing pets to die, children to get sick uh, from nitrate pollution. Uh, they were vastly exceeding uh, the concentrations that they were allowed to enter the atmosphere. So if we're going to address the issue of nitrate pollution in Delaware, we need to rethink the way we produce food. So a traditional back chicken farm um, has high nitrate pollution. Uh, there's often animal cruelty involved and high land usage. Um, if instead we replace this uh, with a precision fermentation farm, which I'll discuss in a moment, you can have zero nitrate pollution, zero animals harmed and far less land usage. So uh, precision fermentation might sort of sound um, like this scary technology for those of you who, are, who aren't familiar, but um, I, I think we're all familiar with the use of fermentation to produce beer and wine. And precision fermentation is actually already used widely for breads and cheeses and a variety of other food products that are commonly consumed. And historically, we've seen market disruptions from precision fermentation uh, for decades, starting with uh, the medicinal field for pharmaceuticals in the 90s to cosmetics and materials in the 2000s. And now precision fermentation is sort of branching out to uh, produce other food products uh, now in the 2020s. Um, so to, to take a step back, I'll sort of explain for a moment what precision fermentation is for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, so carbon, uh, usually sugar uh, in the form of glucose, is consumed by microbes, uh, which are just microscopic organisms, uh, too small to see with the human eye. Um, these are depicted on the left. And within these microbes are, are microbial factories that can selectively convert those carbon molecules to valuable products like food. And then these products can be collected. So the way we currently perform uh, traditional fermentation processes is by feeding uh, corn-derived glucose. Um, so we, we grow corn, we mill the corn, we perform a process called enzymatic hydrolysis and then we get glucose that we can feed to our microbes in a precision fermentation reactor to produce chemicals and food. Um, the big issue with this though is that corn um, is obviously competing with the human food chain and requires a lot of land usage. So ideally you'd want to uh, select a carbon molecule to feed fermentation that uh, could avoid competing with the human food chain and has less land usage. Additionally, um, there is a big market stability issue associated with basing our entire food system around uh, essentially one crop uh, being corn. Uh, we see a lot of market price variants uh, occur in corn over the past decade or so, and uh, I think we should expect this trend to continue as climate change uh, makes the price of corn even more unpredictable as the weather becomes more unpredictable and extreme. Um, Conversely, when we look at industrial electricity, um, there's very little change over the years in, in the market price of electricity relative uh, to, to the starting price. So we see very little market variability as a very stable price and electricity is sort of known for this. So if we can produce carbon using this renewable electricity, um, so say an electrochemical, this would offer superior market stability over these corn derived sugars for fermentation. And of course, we, we know market price stability is, is really important. Um, we've seen recently uh, a, a big surge in egg prices. I think it's settled out a little bit now, but uh, this is, is recent enough to remember. Um, and if we were to shift the production of egg proteins to uh, precision fermentation using electrochemical, uh, surges like this could be avoided. So uh, now we need to think about how we can actually produce an electrochemical to feed our microbes in a precision fermentation reactor. So the way we can do this is um, we have a sort of a, a very accessible source of carbon already um, admitted into the atmosphere um, and that's CO2. So we can take these greenhouse gas emissions in the form of carbon dioxide, which are the, the main driver of climate change, 
And we can feed those into a CO2 electrolyzer. So again, this is just a reactor that runs on electricity. Uh, supply that electrolyzer with renewable electricity and then produce our electrochemicals. So the overall reaction is shown there on the bottom. Now, the thing with CO2 electrolysis is you can produce a, a wide variety of, of products in, in the outlet. Uh, we have gas products, we have liquid products, single carbons, multi-carbons. Um, it's sort of a, a shotgun approach. So getting this to be selective towards one product is, is a big challenge currently. So then the, the question arises of, of which uh, electrochemical should we actually produce to feed to our microbes uh, to, to make food. And recent research uh, from my group has emerged showing that microbes are actually capable of growing on electrochemical acetate that's produced from CO2. And I think many of you are already very familiar with this, this chemical because this is just vinegar. Um, now it tends to be much more concentrated than is found in um, vinegar we use in food. Uh, but it's, it's the same chemical component. Um, and we found we were able to produce yeast, mushroom, plants, uh, and a variety of, of food, and microbes are actually able to grow on acetate and, and make food this way. Um, the issue arises when we look at uh, a CO2 electrolyzer and one step converting CO2 to acetate uh, selectively is actually very difficult. Uh, again, you end up with this sort of shotgunning of a variety of products. You'll get alcohols, you'll get gas products, and acetate as well. And this drives up separation costs significantly to actually isolate the acetate that we want and separate it from the other components. So to address this, uh, we've developed sort of this two-step approach where we take uh, CO2 and convert that to carbon monoxide in one step and then convert that carbon monoxide to the acetate we desire in the second step. And this is a much higher selectivity and performance than in the one-step reactor. And it actually doesn't add any additional cost uh, because carbon monoxide is the, the key intermediate to actually bring CO2 to acetate. We have to go through that pathway anyways. Uh, so really it's just a little bit of additional capital cost, which makes up a very small fraction of the total cost in these systems. But even still with this sort of two-step tandem design, uh, acetate's produced at, at a relatively low concentration and purity, even though it is, is a very selective reaction. So to address this, this issue of, of low concentration and purity, uh, we've developed uh, a new type of CO electrolyzer. So this is the, the reactor used in the second step that we've dubbed an internal tandem oxidation reactor design. So um, in this system, uh, we'll produce our, our, we feed our CO into the cathode, and that reacts with the cathode catalyst and um, gaseous products are produced as well as our liquid products. So we produce acetates uh, as well as uh, a few alcohols. And these will cross over the membrane to the anode side of the reactor. And the acetate will exit with the liquid stream. And then uh, we can carefully select an anode catalyst that will actually convert the undesired alcohols to acetate. So any uh, undesired reactions that occur, they're sort of neutralized in the anode compartment and those side products are converted to the desired product. So then we can end up with a, up to 7.6 molar, uh, which is the highest concentration uh, that's ever been observed in these reactors and is truly state of the art. And we can produce this at over 99% purity. So now that we have this electrosynthesized acetate um, and we can produce this at, at low costs and high performance, um, we can rethink the way we produce food. So we can take this electrosynthesized acetate, feed it to our microbes, and then produce things like egg proteins. And there are actually already existing companies that are doing this and uh, that are on the market today. Uh, you can purchase egg proteins that are produced via precision fermentation. Uh, but these companies are still using sort of these uh, crop-derived uh, feedstocks. They're still using glucose mostly. Um, so if we can switch these companies over to electrosynthesized acetate, uh, we could really drive down the use of land and also make these products much more market stable and resistant to, to future inflation that might occur. So on top of the egg proteins, uh, we're also able to enable uh, cultivated uh, poultry production. Um, so this is uh, sort of your, your lab meat or your, your cultured meat, clean meat, whatever you'd like to call it, where you take uh, a small sample of tissue from, from the animal, um, and then you're able to, uh, using precision fermentation, produce growth factor, 
and then multiply that tissue in, in a lab setting uh, to produce uh, your meat. And uh, there's companies uh, like Just that are already doing this as well. And uh, they're not on the market yet, but they have been given FDA approval and uh, they're making very rapid advancements. Uh, I also wanna emphasize that these egg proteins and cultivated poultry, these aren't um, sort of uh, egg analogs or poultry analogs that are you know, derived from uh, plant-based ingredients or anything like that. Uh, these are actually bioidentical to the animal drive proteins. There's, there's absolutely no difference. Um, and uh, like I said, many of them are already on the market today. I use uh, a whey protein that's derived using precision fermentation. Um, and we're, I think we're gonna see very rapid advancements of this in the next few years. So it's important that we select a good uh, carbon feedstock now before we completely base our entire food system on corn. So of course this raises the question, uh, is using this electrochemical acetate, uh, is it actually any cheaper than using uh, the glucose we get from corn uh, to produce food and chemicals? So uh, actually, if you look at the cost of the feedstock itself, um, acetate is a 20% cheaper carbon source than glucose uh, if we produce it electrochemically. And this is really important, the fermentation reactor, because this carbon feed makes up 78% of the total process cost. Uh, so therefore, you can do some simple math and find that you can produce a 16% cheaper product using electrochemical acetate as opposed to glucose. Uh, thus, acetate offers a superior carbon source for enabling uh, precision fermentation. So in summary, uh, nitrate pollution severely threatens human health in the environment here in Delaware. Uh, but uh, nitrate electrolysis as a solution that converts that nitrate pollution uh, to fertilizer uh, simply lacks economic viability and, and cannot be implemented in the near future. But uh, precision fermentation farming is a more promising solution since I found that 68% of the nitrate pollution in Delaware is a direct result of animal agriculture. So if we can sort of rethink our food system, we could solve this uh, by feeding microbes with electrosynthesized acetate instead of sugar. We could further improve this technology, um, both in terms of affordability and sustainability. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Zhao Group um, for, for helping me out with a lot of this work. Uh, of course, the University of Delaware Environmental Institute, the EPSCOR and, and Project Wicked, as well as the Department of Energy, which has funded a lot of this work as well. Um, and then finally, I, I don't have a, a logo here, but also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who's recently given us a multi-million dollar grant to start scaling up this technology to a commercial level. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. That was a great talk um, and happy to take questions. I'm gonna ask a, a, a first question and, and that was, uh, with regards to your economic analyses, um, are you including uh, the social costs as well? Or are these just individual costs? I mean, I think it's important um, when one's uh, reflecting those costs to be the, if you're using a, a natural, um, uh, a non-renewable source that emits CO2, you have the, the, the social cost of carbon that comes from those productions. And of course, if you're cleaning up the uh, water, and you're taking uh, some of the excess nitrogen out and you're making the water quality better, you're getting some positive values uh, for uh, the social cost of a water cleanup. Now, these are the things that, that really fundamentally justify uh, subsidies or taxes, depending on, on what you're, uh, you're thinking about, but, but certainly from an economics perspective need to be included. I don't know if they'll move your, your needle enough, um, but I just was curious uh, to see if you've included the social uh, as well as the individual private costs. Yeah, so I have thought a little bit about social costs. Um, I think including social costs can be a bit challenging. Um, they, they can be a bit dubious at times and, and, and sort of justifying them and, and uh, publication. Um, I, but I, even, I, yeah, I don't think so at all. I think you'll find a, a broad literature on economics that will give you uh, very clear ranges of what those values are, and and I think would be would be fine to include. I mean, there's, there's a lot of work out there by people like Dr. Parsons and others who are true experts in, in measuring the social costs. And I don't think they'd be anything dubious about it at all. There, you know, like like any anything, it's not you can never measure it perfectly. But I don't think there's. I think the literature is well well uh, resolved in including social costs. Yeah. The, okay. I agree. I think so. Even without considering the social costs, which I 
haven't, to answer your question, I've not considered the social costless analysis. I found that simply by switching to the current cost of renewable electricity production for these reactors, we can produce acetate cheaper than it's currently produced uh, with a fossil-based route. So the economics actually work out quite well without including these social costs. So that's a sort of part of my justification for why I, I didn't extend this and then start to include those costs. Thanks. Uh, if I could ask a question, uh, uh, Brady, really nice talk and enjoy that very much. I have a question. Is the CO2 concentration, the initial CO2 concentration important in you are turning that into you know, acetate? Yes, so that, that's very important. The source of the CO2 uh, is critical for achieving high performance in these reactors. So uh, when we think about where we would actually source the CO2, um, I think it's very unlikely we'd actually take flue gas from say a natural gas or a coal plant um, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of contaminants in that gas, sulfur and things like that, that would poison our catalysts. So ideally uh, we would take uh, CO2 that's directly coming from um, ethanol fermentation, for example. And that's a very pure source of CO2, very concentrated. Um, then later down the line, uh, perhaps uh, direct air capture technology could capture CO2 directly from the atmosphere and we could feed that to the reactor. So, so, so the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is very low in that sense for the industry. Yes, yeah. so you wouldn't although, be able to directly feel yeah, ambient although air. Although for these. climate change, uh, you know, it's very high because that's all the cause of warming. So the, uh, this is really a follow-up comment. Uh, the climate change community actually is now actively moving to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and ocean system because it's coupled. So people are actually using electrochemical method to generate the acid and, and mix that with the seawater. Then you generate a very high CO2 from seawater. Uh, and that way you actually remove CO2 and, and fix that CO2 into geological uh, system. Uh, but uh, here you can turn that into food. That's even better. So I think this uh, technology when it's combined with, you know, that uh, uh, electrolysis, electrically to generate acid to, to extract CO2 from seawater, would make it really interesting for the climate change research for this uh, so-called CO2, CDR, CO2 removal technology. Yeah, that's certainly one of the, the main motivations of CO2 electrolysis is to provide economic onboarding for carbon capture. So rather than simply burying that carbon, uh, we can generate value from it. Yeah. Improve economics. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amy, can I ask a question? Yeah, please go ahead, Pei. Hi, I'm Brady. Thank you. I enjoy your talk. I uh, was wondering about how the electron flows. Um, can you tell me like roughly what percent of the electron goes to acetate as opposed to the gaseous products? And yeah. whether you can maybe redirect those gaseous products and rechannel the electrons for acetate production or how, uh, what's the fate of those gaseous products? Yes, so uh, when we think about the fraction of electrons that are used, um, I'm, I'm not sure what your background is, but typically we use the term Faraday efficiency to describe that. Um, so we can get about 60 to 70 uh, percent Faraday efficiency. Uh, so 60 to 70 percent of our electrons going towards acetate. Um, the rest uh, typically will go towards ethylene, um, which is another multi-carbon product. Now, uh, the good part is, is since that's a gas product and acetates in a liquid stream, um, those self-separate. Um, so we can actually sell that ethylene and, and provide value there too. And ethylene's a, you know, a massive commodity chemical used in plastics production and a variety of other things too. Um, so that's actually not an issue if we produce some ethylene on the side. The real issue is avoiding other liquid products from mixing into that acetate stream. I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. Brady, I'll say uh, one more thing. I, I think I, I really enjoyed your talk and I really thought that it was really uh, fascinating work. Um, one thing I, I, I've learned from our water colleagues is that uh, it, it probably won't be so simple as just stopping agriculture today to clean up our water. Um, 
that that when one looks at these uh, nutrients, many have been uh, uh, captured in the soil uh, over decades, and we call legacy uh, legacy pollutants, right? And so they're being released uh, over time. Um, and so you could you could have perfect farming today, or perfect septic systems, right? Which is another major source of of, of pollution in our state is, is is failing septic systems and other spots. But you could you could make them all perfect today, and our water doesn't immediately clean out in uh, three months, six months, you know, six years, unfortunately. So the the need to uh, to, just you know to stop the pollution, you know, certainly is a valuable thing. But it will be important also, just as you tell your story, that there to recognize that there are some legacy issues um, that would be um, you know important there. So we have to both clean it up uh, now and into the future, and that's a challenge. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. Amy, do we? Um, can I ask a, another question if we have time? Sure. Yeah, we've got a couple more minutes. Yes, please. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Brady was wondering about the catalyst for the first mm -hmm. stage, uh, CO two reduction to CO, and then the second stage. Um, what kind of, um, I, if you can disclose that information, what kind of catalysts are involved? Yeah. So I, I can disclose that. Um, this is just the CO two electrolyte here. But the first step where that goes to CO, uh, typically we use silver uh, for that step. Um, just the silver catalyst is very good at, at converting CO two to CO, and with that, uh, we can get you know, like 99% ferritic efficiency. So that's that's a very easy reaction to run. Um, and the second step to convert the carbon monoxide uh, to a multi-carbon product um, in the field, it's known that copper is actually the only catalyst that's mm -hmm. able to convert um, CO2 or CO to, to multiple carbon products. Interesting. Okay. Great. Thank you. So yeah, there's been a lot of develop on development and catalysts in this field. Right. All right. Well, again, thank you for both of our speakers today. They did a fantastic job. Thank you for sharing your insights and knowledge uh, to the group. And uh, thank everyone for being here today. So be well. Thank you.